songs that I remember distinctly was uh, at the end of the night where no water to go to buy the water. We don't want to leave you. We don't want to, we don't want to say goodbye, we don't want to leave you, you know, we just want to have a drink and stuff. Did you think go on uh, chorus after? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there are. There's numerous of them, right? Uh, well, yeah, anything. Is that like the, in your eyes nope. bothering you? Nope, it's okay. Okay, okay right. this is uh, Joe Martin, and it's uh, August the August the 18th, 1998. Yeah, the day after Clinton's exculpatory. Oh, geez. Statement. Yes, yes. We have Joe Martin, the. Uh, senior and only social worker of the Pike Place Market Clinic. Well, actually, there are other social workers here, but I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm one of the people who started the clinic, and I'm uh, still a social worker. Okay. So, you know, I've right. been here a while. Uh, give us a little background on you, on yourself, man. Where were you before you came to the clinic, and what did you do? Well, uh, prior to coming to the Pike Market Medical Clinic, I uh, worked as a uh, kind of a street person's advocate uh, uh, with the Skid Road community uh, based at the First Avenue Service Center. Uh, the local Mennonite volunteer program uh, funded my uh, tenure there. And uh, although I'm not a Mennonite, uh, they were, they were uh, great uh, to uh, take me on as a volunteer. And, uh, I was there from roughly March of 1977 till about uh, May of 78. And in the course of that time, while at the First Avenue Service Center, I met uh, Chris Hurley. And uh, Chris at the time uh, told me about her project in the works to uh, put a clinic uh, in the downtown that would serve uh, the needs of uh, sp primarily low-income elderly people, but uh, other folks as well who worked and lived in and around the market, uh, who were low income or of uh, moderate means. And uh, I assisted Chris and others in that project. And when the uh, dream became reality, uh, Chris asked if I would consider becoming the social worker here. And uh, I took her up on it. And I've been here since September of 1978. Yeah. OK, uh, the first. Um physical presence of the Pike Market Medical Clinic was the old Tavern. In the old Mother Lode, Mother it was Lode. at the Mother Lode Tavern. Uh, and uh, we should remember, too, that if, uh, in the months prior to the September opening of the clinic at the Mother Lode site up on uh, First Avenue, in the 1600 block of First Avenue, uh, Cecil Frank, the first nurse at the clinic, and Chris Hurley both were doing some of the initial work of the clinic uh, uh, in uh, a couple of, uh, in one little office in the, uh, 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 one of the uh, spaces in the Pike Market itself. And uh, then finally when the uh, Mother Lode Tavern space was uh, open for clinical occupation, we all uh, moved in there and started doing our work. And I think, I think the first, uh, I can't remember exactly the first day, but uh, it was, uh, I think September 9th, at least that's when I started, I think. And, uh, but uh, I think there might be some differences as to exactly what day the clinic officially started, but I think September of 78 is a good, good point. Okay, you yeah. came on as a social worker. I did, yeah. So what was the social work um, need at that time? Uh, well, it was much like what I'm doing now. Uh, I think the times are very different. Again, this was pre-Reagan, uh, although uh, the uh, late 70s were uh, not the greatest of times even then for addressing the needs of low-income and poor people uh, in Seattle, although they were far, far better than the days we would encounter after the election of Mr. Reagan. Uh, I think that a lot of the things that I was doing then are the same kinds of things I do now. I do a lot of advocacy. I do a lot of uh, navigational assistance. And in other words, I help people get through the labyrinth of social and bureaucratic systems that are there to assist people, but often can baffle them as much as they assist them. So hopefully my intervention provides a little bit of uh, uh, confidence. And, and I also hope, and I think I can say that I get a lot of people results when I do help them. Is it mostly a geriatric? 
Uh, no, I would say that uh, although I see elderly folks and a lot of retired people, I encounter a lot of people who are middle-aged folks who are homeless or out of work or disabled uh, due to physical or mental problems. Uh, uh, and also I encounter a lot of people with alcohol and drug uh, problems. I think we can also say we're seeing more and more younger people who are working uh, or trying to work and want to work and very much want to find a job that will pay them a livable wage and who are doing the best they can on minimal wages but uh, who often find that when they get ill or they need assistance in navigating the medical system or some other system it's often very uh, daunting for them. In 78 and 79, when the clinic was just getting started, uh, did uh, you have to do a lot of outreach, or were yeah. they just walking in the, in the we, uh, People did find us, but back in the early days, of course, uh, we weren't necessarily an institution. Uh, I think we can say that we're an, a bit of an institution at this point, so a lot of people know of us through word of mouth and just by the fact we've been here so long. Mm -hmm. But uh, back in those days, we did have to make ourselves known. We had to make our presence known to people in the community mm -hmm. so that uh, there was a lot of outreach. I, back in those days, did a lot more uh, outreach to the various hotels and apartment buildings and so forth. And of course, the sad thing is that a lot of those places that I used to go and visit people in uh, are no longer there. Or if they are there, they've been uh, uh, converted into a higher income use. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's also one of the tragedies of this community and many urban communities throughout this country is the, the uh, loss and the ongoing loss of affordable housing. And of course in Seattle now, uh, this is uh, uh, regular uh, weekly news. Uh, most of the uh, 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 newspapers in the Seattle region have recorded uh, significant stories uh, related to low-income housing uh, uh, loss and the lack of affordable housing, even for people who are making relatively uh, decent wages. Yesterday's Seattle Times reported that uh, a uh, apartment house with 150 units or so like that was being built in downtown Del Bellevue, or right. had been built and was being was filling up, right. just like Marvin Gardens right. here. They're just one single room right. without, without a stove actually. It's right. Hot thing. right. And uh, it's, it's as close as you can get to a SRO. That's right. As you had. And yet, yet there were burgers and people criticizing this and saying, well, it's terrible. It's going to attract drifters and things. Well, all I can. Who do they think carried out their garbage? All, all I can say is that the uh, social and economic order that we now have in the United States of America in 1998 is guaranteed. Uh, create a lot more people who uh, are uprooted, uh, who have no uh, economic uh, place, and uh, who uh, will probably in large part remain homeless or uh, in a near homeless state uh, in the city that they are currently in. But there'll always be a percentage of people who, when they become homeless or whose jobs become uh, 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 endangered or, or if they lose their jobs, they, they will move on and try and find some other kind of locale to uh, start over in. Uh, but back in the old days, back at the turn of the century on up to the 70s in Seattle certainly and in many other cities throughout the country, uh, single room occupancy uh, hotels were the name of the game for a lot of uh, low income working people. What they didn't know in Bellevue was that when the uh, Palace Hotel was built in San Francisco after the earthquake, the whole block square, a thousand rooms or something like that. They took two blocks south of the mission to build housing for the people who were going to work in it. Yeah, sure. Right. And uh, so they had that planned out. Right. Something to uh, can you just sort of rattle off the uh, the names of the directors that you worked under here? Yeah. Uh, well, first and foremost, well, well, Chris Hurley, of course, okay. the uh, the legendary founder of the clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott Glasscock, a great person, followed Chris. Uh, Chris was here from roughly 78 to 83, and Scott was here from roughly 83 to about 88. They both served about five-year terms. Uh, following Scott was Gloria Albetta, and Gloria was here for about seven years. And uh, she was followed by uh, Jeremy Sappington, who um, Jeremy was only here a, a brief time. Uh, and uh, replacing Jeremy is a very fine uh, woman, Linda Lake who's been with us now for uh, over a year and is uh, 
very impressive and very committed to the mission of this clinic. Is there a burnout factor, do you think, five years, seven years? I think there might be. Um, I think there is. I mean, the director of a place like this has a great deal to do. Mm -hmm. uh, they not only are, I think as institutions go, you know, we are, we, we are not that big, uh, and I would be happy to go on record as saying I hope we don't get too big, uh, but we are big enough so that we do have some trappings of a, of a large uh, institution, but at the same time we have conscientiously, a lot of us, tried to keep it a very community oriented and a community spirited kind of facility that is not only good to the patients and clients we serve, but hopefully good to the people who work here and make this facility a special place. And I think with that kind of environment, the directors uh, also are uh, uh, encouraged, uh, certainly by a lot of us, to, to, to be as involved with us as uh, fellow workers as they are able to be, given the fact that they have to be outside doing the fundraising, doing the grant writing, making sure that uh, the uh, rules and regs are being met by our facility and at the same time uh, making sure that they don't get too far away from the from the grassroots of what it is we're about here. I've got two questions. One is, uh, can you kind of uh, survey the relationship the clinic has had with the uh, Pike Place Market PDA, which is the principal landlord and manager in the market? I, I, I mean, I think the clinic's relationship, I'm probably not the best one to ask this of, so it, it, it would be better that that be asked maybe of no, but from your perspective, I, I would say from my perspective, the clinic as, as a facility, as an entity within the Pike Market has had, I think, a fairly smooth and cooperative relationship with the PDA. Um, I also think it's fair to say that the uh, uh, PDA is aware of the uh, important service that we provide to the people who live downtown and to many of the people who work in the market and make the market what it is. Um, and I think that the, uh, uh, the fact that the Market Foundation and its relationship with the PDA has uh, established over the years the kind of commitment and uh, uh, support system it has been able to, to put together for not only the clinic but for some yeah, of the other social services. My last question was yeah. what is the relationship with the foundation since it was formed yeah. to the clinic? Well, as far again, from my own perspective, I would say that the uh, uh, Market Foundation's relationship with the clinic is again a very positive one and one that uh, it has enabled us to uh, continue to do the work that we do. I mean, the Market Foundation's primarily, uh, primary focus is to, uh, to raise money and to uh, provide that financial support for the clinic and for the senior center and the food bank and the child care facility. And I think a lot of the people connected with the Market Foundation uh, from Mar Marlis Erickson on down uh, are very, very committed to the kind of mission that the Pike Market Clinic has always adhered to since 1978. Yeah. Um, I have one more question running around my head there. But, um, yeah, this is the final question. Um, how, uh, what is the relationship of the Pike Medical Clinic to uh, similar clinics in the similar, similar public clinics in mm -hmm. the city? Uh, the <coughs> Country Doctor up there, the Greenwood Clinic, mm -hmm. and some of these others that are <coughs> semi-independent, uh, autonomous. Yeah, we all we all have our own boards yeah. and so forth and directors. Well, again, from my own perspective, mm -hmm. I see all of the clinics uh, that are set up along the lines of our facility. Uh, what we are all trying to do is provide uh, a uh, medical and social services infrastructure for a significant segment of the Seattle community that would not have uh, the kinds of medical services and social services they do if the Pike Market Clinic and our sister clinics weren't here. Uh, a city is not simply uh, 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 a, a region comprised of wealthy people or people whose lives are going smoothly and who have homes and who have good jobs and who have uh, 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 dependable uh, and, and healthy uh, living situations. Uh, cities in our time, sadly, 
are also places where there are a lot of people who are uh, living lives of extraordinary economic insecurity. Uh, many, many people, increasingly so, are, are homeless. Uh, increasing numbers of people are finding it impossible to maintain even the most modest home uh, while working a 40-hour work week. In an environment like that, uh, which hopefully, again, uh, will not remain the same forever, and I'm hoping for a more humane and more socially conscious society in the future, but in the meantime, uh, the Pike Market Clinic and our sister clinics provide a tremendous service and uh, needed service to ensure the uh, uh, the, the, the lives of a significant number of people who wouldn't have medical care and social services if we weren't here. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we got to that We're close um, staff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron will ask what. Uh, okay, can you each are? just state your names and the general years that you were here and what you did? Okay, I'm Gretchen Bernay, and I was here in, uh, let's see, 1982, and I left in 1985, and I was a nurse practitioner. I believe I was the first one. Wow, that's great. Clinic, so. Great. And my name's Shirley Crawford, and I was here from 80, what did I write there? 83. <laughs> 83 to 85, and I was a social worker. Oh, great. And actually, I didn't work as a social worker here, I worked as a therapist. Okay. Psychotherapist. And when you think about the clinic now that you've been away for a number of years, what what do you think about when you think of the clinic? Oh, I miss it. I do too. Yeah. It's and I haven't kept in touch, so I'm really mm -hmm. I don't know how <laughs> things have changed or evolved. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's probably a, very much the same, but mm -hmm. maybe there are changes. Who's got better? Yeah. It's pretty good. <laughs> I think maybe on three occasions I've come back when one of the therapists has been on vacation and run the groups and seen patients in their absence and so I've kept a little bit in touch. Um, and I just miss the camaraderie, I love the people here, I love the patients and I love the staff. They're just, I've never worked at a place that was finer in terms of patient care and just the way people support one another and su and really have a genuine regard for the patient. Mm -hmm. and so we and why do you think so that is? Support. Any any hunches on that explanation? Why? I think there was an original vision that has remained honored in terms of the kinds of people who are hired as part of mm -hmm. it. I think it would be interesting to interview those that are still here. There are a few that were here when both mm -hmm. and I were working. So. And some of the old timers who started mm -hmm. the clinic. But there really is a special feeling here. I've worked a lot of places. I've been doing this work for close to 30 years. And there is an atmosphere here that's very different. And some of it's the patients, too. I mean, mm -hmm. they're just really wonderful, open people. And um, not all open, but wonderful people. And people who have been associated with the market, which I think has a special feeling, too. Great. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, I do miss it, and it, uh, it, it is a very special place. Um, I've had a few jobs since, and I always think about coming back, although the thing is uh -huh. a bit difficult. Well, it, I don't know who the tape will be shown to, but I just want to say to the patients I saw, I really miss them. <laughs> I do. They're wonderful people. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so okay. this past year, um, the Market Foundation has been going to events like this and trying to interview people about their impressions and for you specifically about the clinic. Okay. So, um, you ready? <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> um, why don't we just start off by just Stating your name, the years that you were here, and what you did while you were here. Okay. My name is Victoria Toy Gibbs, and I started part time as a data entry person. And um, I've been here since '84, between '84 and '87, I think it was. And um, I had worked for a cardiac surgeon for 14 years prior to that. And when I came to the clinic, it was really a whole different atmosphere. And I was really impressed with the work that was done here. 
and how they just like to help the low income and, and those that just needed help. And then I got them to let me do medical transcription for them on a full-time basis because they were sending their transcription out. And I said, hey, I've been doing this for you know so many years. I probably can handle it. And so I, that's what I did. And the only reason I left was because um, I think I just masked myself out because I was doing, you know, too many things at once. <laughs> and now, um, when you think back on the clinic, what, what kind of impressions or what images come to your mind when you think about the clinic that you've been away for a while? Mm, just that everybody was so caring. I really appreciate all the volunteers <laughs> that came in. And I made a lot of friends through people I've met here and worked with. And most of us still keep in contact with each other. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add about the clinic or your experiences with the clinic? No. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Do you have any recollection of the uh, relationship of this clinic to other clinics in the uh, downtown area or in no. Uh, not really. <laughs> no. Thank you. Right now? Okay, I'm Joanne Keenan, and I don't remember which years I was here. I was here probably for about a year and a half, maybe, not more than two years at the outside, and I think I left in '88. I was uh, Monday. Uh, VM clinic day nurse, so I worked with the VM doctors, and uh, VM being Virginia Mason station people up here on, on Monday. So I worked with them and followed their patients and, and uh, carried on when we switched switched interns, and that was it was kind of fun. I came here from Harborview. I'm actually still at Harborview as a nurse on the medicine floor there, and uh, it was just kind of a I came down and talked to Carol Glenn about uh, volunteering and she said sure so I, I came on and it was just a it got me out, out of the hospital working with patients who were walking around having lives instead of patients who were just in their beds being sick and it just it was a shot in the arm for me in that way one of the things I guess when you were asking Victoria about um, what it was about this place and the people here I think the thing that has left a lasting impression with me is that in any place you work things get political people are people and people do that sort of thing but here more than any place else I've ever been it seems that the political stuff was gathered together and energized and put out there to fight the good fight instead of instead of cat fighting and infighting it was just it was a team and um, you know, it was it was just a pleasure. You know, didn't need to be paid to work here. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's right. But I got a lot more out of it than than I put in. I think. Great. How okay. would you um, describe? Are there any obvious distinctions between working at like Harborview and and here? Well, Harborview, we get a lot a lot of clients that are very very much like the patients that that are seen here. Uh, I will say that it's a pleasure to do discharge planning and teaching with a patient who's coming, who's one of the Pike Market clinics. I mean, they know the doctors here. They know Tom and Les or whoever, whoever it is. So it's like if they're if they've been plugged into this clinic, they know they're going to be taken care of, and and there's no arguing about making an appointment. They just and and I feel good. I know they'll be taken care of here because I I know what goes on here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. Yeah. Um, let's just start off by. Can I ask you who are you? My uh, my name is Karen. I'm Karen. The Market Foundation. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Um, just state your name, the uh -huh. years about you were here and what you did while you were here. Okay. I'm Marta Hunt, Marta Richardson, and now Hunt, and I worked here from '83 to '87. And I was the nurse for Dr. Piddle, so Les Piddle. So now that you've been away for a few years, and you think back about the clinic, are there any kind of overall impressions or images that come to your mind? 
Yeah, I think I, I knew when I was here that I'd never have such a rare job again. And I haven't. Uh, there's the community and spirit that, of friendship that, and more than that, uh, ideals and I don't know what, some sort of heart connection. I don't think, I, I haven't found it since. I didn't expect to find it. When I left here, I really felt like a chunk of my heart had just been taken out. It was bleeding for what I was leaving. And I, it was very hard to leave, but I had these career goals of getting into obstetrics that, you know, made me move on, but it, was, it would have been so easy to stay forever and stay connected to, because there was so many ways that it fed my heart. And um, what are you doing now? I'm working, I went first to Overlake and worked for a year in labor and delivery, orienting to labor and delivery, and got tired of that commute and then joined uh, Swedish labor and delivery and worked there, whatever, in labor and delivery until 94, and then joined, started having kids and join their outpatient services. And so it's women and infants outpatient services at Swedish. So, you, uh, so you're in labor and delivery. What did you think of that UPS strike last Sunday? Oh, <laughs> the, oh. <laughs> Cheers, you got me. <laughs> That's a curveball. <laughs> so what, what would you say are the major similarities or differences between working at some place like Swedish versus here? There are probably no similarities. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and the, it's so huge, you know, when this is so uh, intimate and everybody knows each other. And, uh, you know, I think years from now I'll still come back and visit people at the clinic that I still know and I don't think I would go back to Swedish and visit. So it's, um, yeah, it's totally different. Uh, and it's really special to be at a reunion and be able to see the people that had meant so much to me. So, That's great. Yeah. And is there anything else you'd like to add? No. Long live Pike Market Clinic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see Les Piddle here? I'd, I'd love to see Les. I haven't seen him yet. Oh. No. Is he here? Yeah. Is he here? Um, he's here. <laughs> That's all I can say. I saw him from across the room. Yeah, he looked. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, you. thank you. Okay. Let's just start off by if you can tell me your name and about the years that you were here and what you did while you were here. Well, my name is Sarah Coyle, and I came to Seattle in 1983. And in 1984, I started working at the clinic. And I started part-time as the de development director. I think I was really their first development director and started to put a fundraising program together for them. My legacy is the Feast of the Market, mm. which at that time we called Taste of the Market. <laughs> and so that's really what I, I was only here about a year, maybe a little less than a year. And I only worked part-time and had to move on to full-time. but. As I wrote in the um, little legacy down the hall, um, I count my time here at Pike Market Clinic probably one of the greatest blessings in my life because I came at a time when I needed a family worse than anything. I had lost a 21-year-old son the summer before and I was recovering from all of that grief and the people here were the family I was looking for and it was absolutely wonderful. It really was one of the greatest things in my life. So I was very happy to find, to, you know, to hear about this and be able to come back and see so many people. Okay. So. Um, how, tell us a little bit about how the feast, or the taste at the time was born. Well, it was born because the market was what made the market community and the market neighbors were really what I thought made the clinic unique. It was our neighborhood, and everybody knew everybody. And the restaurateurs were very, very cooperative. But one of the things I think that really made it a success was that I realized what the restaurateurs needed from us. And so we didn't ask for more than they could give us. And it was set up right from the beginning, I think. And it was a hit right from the start. And that was really probably the most fun 
that I had here was putting that together. And uh, it yeah, much it hasn't. It really hasn't. Concepts and it, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's right. And 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 the concept was that each restaurateur could fix one dish that they wanted to present, and we always covered their gratuities and their service people because that's what they can't really cover. That's mm -hmm. what they really can't give away. Mm -hmm. So it was a win-win situation for all of us. And, we had, we had newspaper coverage the first year, and it was all very exciting. It was really a lot of fun. How many restaurants did you have? We had 12 restaurants wow. the very first year. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the market community and got to know a lot of people in the, in the market. And I remember I had a, a friend at the time that used to tease me because one, one of the other little projects that I tried, which was really quite funny, was um, milk bottles at all of the cash registers throughout the market. And I would go around on Fridays and empty the pennies, you know. <laughs> and he said, you truly are a fundraiser at the grassroots. <laughs> you know? That one was not as exciting and not as wonderful as the other. <laughs> but it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Nancy Nipples to this day keeps a milk bottle on her. her right. <laughs> yeah, I remember Nancy. Yeah. And she was on the board and probably still is. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything it's else fun. you'd like to add? No. Nope. Can't think of anything except that I'm really happy to see that the budget has doubled and the number of clients has doubled and it's a real, it's, it's growing and that's what it should. It deserves to grow and, it, and it's really needed. It's, it's one of the things that makes living in Seattle wonderful, community clinics like this, and this is one of the best. We all know that. So it's great. It's fun. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. Thank you. Now edit that. Hi. Great. So can you just start us off by stating your name, the year you were here, and what you did during that time? Well, my name's Cindy Johnson, and I came at the mother load and I was a, a lab tech and I was working part-time at Swedish and in the lab and I got a job here working part-time and held both of them for a while and I stayed here for three years, three and a half years and um, thoroughly enjoyed my experience here and uh, being part of the team and Joe and Chris and Betsy and everybody else <laughs> and Rocky. We, we had a good time. I used to do, as a lab tech, I wanted to get more patient experience, so I used to go out and find patients in bars and change dressings in hotel rooms. <laughs> a lot of things most people wouldn't do. Joe and I would have to occasionally throw an inebriated gentleman out of the clinic, but generally we would do it in a very gentle way, and it would work. And let's see, what else can I tell you? This is how naive I was. <clears throat> My lab was at the site of the tree uh, behind the, the Pike Market Inn and people used to sit under that tree and tell stories and you could hear all kinds of terrible things there. But one day I said to Joe, I said, or my husband, I said to him, where are those right. low sinks in the lab? The tree that's there now. It's the same tree. Well, the inn was not there. The inn wasn't there. That's where the mother load was and right. the, the window to my lab which was up, you know, about five feet, mm -hmm. looked out and that tree was right there. Yeah. And uh, we, it was a simple little lab. We used to run CBCs and gram stains and um, actually we didn't do CBCs. We did crits and white counts and UAs and those kinds of things. But uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> what I said to him was that, uh, what are those low sinks in there for? <laughs> and I finally figured out it used to be the men's urinal. So <laughs> and we just used them every night to, uh, to mop the floor down. Well, we had two exam rooms and uh, uh, sort of social area for the senior center, and we all kind of existed, coexisted together. And it worked pretty well. So, how did it work going from Swedish on Sundays to the mother load on other days? Was it an easy <clears throat> adjustment, or was it? It was. It was okay. I was. You know, I'd done Swedish for a number of years, and I was kind of tired, and and I wanted to to go on to a different different uh, line of employment. I wanted to be a PA. <clears throat> or a nurse practitioner at that point, and so I did my lab work there. And I was, it was wonderful to be in a clinic doing lab work that made sense with what was going on with the patient 
and connected instead of just numbers in a line. <laughs> it was really great to do that. So it was a really creative, growing clinic at that time. Great. And now that you've been away for a number of years, and when you think back about the clinic, are there any images or <laughs> any memories that particularly stand out? Hmm. Hmm. I remember one time we took a picture and we all um, dressed up in fishermen's aprons and we had implements of destruction and <laughs> knives and we were acting kind of goofy and crazy. I think it was in the MOR room, as I remember. <laughs> that was one thing. I also got to pick out the lab counters that were purple to go with gram stains. Um, mostly though, I remember the patients. I remember different people. I, I, I really remember we used to keep a list running on the post about who had died and some days, some weeks were hard weeks and I know it's changed because when I was here it was geriatric medicine and we had lots of older semen dying of um, end stage heart disease and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and now it's all changed to AIDS but it, it was hard then too in many ways. So I, I think about the patients and trying to get them to come in and do their thing and interact with us. Yeah. And I remember going out and beating the streets and doing blood pressures too, just trying to get people to realize we were here and uh, be a part of the community and be a service to the community. Which is something the clinic is starting to do again, mm -hmm. going out on the streets and doing blood pressure. Uh-huh. Right. Oh yeah, we used to do that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> right. Circle. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's very is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, well, I, I think Coming and working at this clinic was a, a really good training for going to be a PA. It was really good for me. And I'd been at Lab Tech seven years, so I, I was just tired of doing that. And I needed more. And this place gave me the opportunity to do that, to grow and change. And it was great. PA is physician's assistant? Yeah, I'm a physician assistant. How does that differ from nurse? I, it's a, a program at the University of Washington. It's a national program. There's a board certification, and you, you are basically doing what a nurse practitioner would do. You basically are doing physicals, exams. Write, I write prescriptions. Um, I co-manage a panel now at Group Health in Everett. And, you know, we do 80%, I would say, of what a family physician does. I, you know, I'd say that because I'm a woman, I see probably more women, and I do more women's health care than some family docs do, but I do a lot. I do fractures, I do sewing, I do hypertension. I like diabetics. And so after this job, I went on to, to the Indian Health Board and worked there nine years, oh, wow. another place, and I, I really enjoyed that too. So it's kind of funny to be uh, from the community clinics and out in the real world, yeah. but I, th I think uh, my best experiences were here and at the Indian Health Board. Great. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> we're doing this little video oral history. Great. Yeah, yeah. So can we just start with um, just stating your name, the time, the dates that you were here, and what you mm -hmm. did during that period? Sure. Uh, my name's Elizabeth Swain, and I was uh, I worked at the front desk at the clinic from uh, the middle of 90, the, excuse me, the middle of 81 to the middle of 83, for two years, early in the clinic's history. And uh, can you? Was your daughter? Let me interrupt this here. Was your daughter in the uh, market at that time? My daughter was uh, not even a twinkle in the eye at that okay. time. I had a son at that time who was about five years old, and he started kindergarten when I worked here, and it was a big event for the entire clinic. There were only about 15 people on the staff. It was a very closely knit family. When you think about the clinic now that you've been away for a number of years, are there images or memories that stand out? The, uh, the Five Market Clinic was really the most valuable and significant work that I did, that I've done in my life. It's, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I chose the, the work because of the, um, the, you know, the connection with people, that it, the opportunity to, to work with people that it presented. And um, but through it learned that uh, communities are built on, communities like the, the Pike Market community and the, and the clinic 
are built on the kind of com compassion that, that people are able to show to each other uh, around basic human needs, healthcare being a really basic one, housing being another. Um, so I was, you know, really deeply committed at the time that I took the job to the, to the mission of the, of the clinic and of the community. Um, and since then, actually, now I'm the director of the 45th Street Clinic, which is another one of the community clinics in Seattle, and w would not have made that decision, um, have been there for 10 years, would not have made that decision if I had not worked here at the front desk. So it was, you know, it was really a life, um, significant life choice for me, and I'm, uh, I'm still in awe of uh, what it meant in my life. I imagine that there's a lot of similarities between 45th Street and Pike Market. Would that be true? We have a large homeless population at 45th Street Clinic, which we draw from all over, homeless families. And a lot of uh, our work with homeless is really parallel with the work that's done here. Um, we don't have anywhere near the elderly population at 45th Street that this clinic um, sees. Uh, one of the most amazing experiences that I had here was that I made connections with patients. Um, and there are pictures of me on the video um, talking to patients that, I mean, it's amazing to see these pictures that are 18 years old, um, who became my friends and, uh, and whose lives I, I stayed close to and in many cases watched them die and, and said goodbye to them that way. Um, but also spent time, you know, talking with them and laughing with them and telling stories with them and um, eating with them. It's just it's an incredible community, an amazing community. So um, there are parallels and there aren't. I mean, I'm also the director of 40 District Clinic, which means I'm not, I, 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 I virtually, I'm, I'm cut off from the patients. And here I was immersed. I was at the front desk, which is actually the, almost the same front desk that is sitting there right now. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So it was. Uh, I mean, I, I love the, this clinic. I've been close to it for the last 20 years, and um, you know, it's always going to be the, uh, the sort of the, the, the work that this clinic does is, is really um, uh, the kind of work that all the clinics should be doing, and, and a lot of them aren't doing this kind of work. I think that's probably it. Thanks for. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. That was great. Where are you going? Um, let's oh, that's just right. start with just naming your, your, stating your name, saying the years that you've been here and, and your job. Okay. My name is Jana Ostrom. Um, I came in 1983 and I still work at the clinic continuously and I am a pharmacist. So you've been here for? 15 years. 15 years. Mm -hmm. Why have you stayed so long? It's a good place to work. It's a, it's a wonderful place to be able to do the kind of work that I think is important, working with low-income people, um, providing what I consider to be very quality health care um, to people regardless of their ability to pay. And I also just really have enjoyed the opportunity to work on a team basis so closely with all of these different disciplines. I mean, I, could, I can just <laughs> yell over a half wall at the doctors from my pharmacy. And if I don't understand something that's going on, I can check back with them. I have access to the chart. It's a very rich pharmaceutical experience. It, it's really unusual. And, and the kind of things, the kind of personal touch that we can do for people is so unusual and getting, unfortunately, more so. I could go on and on. <laughs> Have you worked in other pharmacies or other clinics? Mm -hmm. I, when I, well, when I first came here, I was hired in a, a circuit writing position. So I was one of two pharmacists who together served Carolyn Downs International District um, Country Doctor and Pike. And so I was at three of those places. I was at Pike International District and um, Pike International District and Carolyn Downs. Um, so I had those clinic experiences at the same time I was getting started here. In terms of other clinics, when I was a student, I did a brief internship at the Seattle Indian Health Board Clinic. And I think that was one of the places that kind of whetted my appetite for doing this kind of work. 
because it's a somewhat similar setup. Mm -hmm. Would you characterize those other clinics as very similar? Well, each of them has their own personality. They, um, they have a flavor that comes partly from the population they serve. You know, the International District Clinic obviously serves a really different population than the market clinic does. Um, they also have a different flavor from the kind of staff they had, and particularly from the administration. I would say overall, each of them had really dedicated people who were, you know, all had pretty similar aims, but the way they got carried out, you know, was a little bit different. I have to say I've, I've always preferred Pike, <laughs> not to disparage the other clinics, but this was just the one that really clicked with me. Is there a person, a story, or a memory that you'll take, just one, <laughs> which are this many, you'll take to your grave that'll, you know, that you'll look back someday and, and say that that's, that's why I was there, that's, that's why I worked so hard? Well, yeah. Um, I remember one of our patients, and I guess it really wasn't a patient that I had directly that much to do with. Actually, I can think of two people, but um, one of them was a man who had some kind of neuromuscular problem, and I, I don't remember what it was. He walked with crutches with great difficulty, and through the auspices of the clinic was able to have surgery and literally threw away his crutches. And, and I still remember, that was probably in about 80, 85, I would guess. I mean, it was such a miracle. And this was someone who probably would have been on the streets with his crutches for the rest of his life without getting access to health care that we were able to provide. And I remember another patient who um, saw one of our Virginia Mason residents and had been a very cantankerous kind of person, um, hard to deal with. And he was able to have cataract surgery. And I remember him coming in and just being ecstatic over the fact that he could see again. He could really see colors. He could see clearly. And it was just, you know, the kind of story that, you know, sounds like it ought to be on film, that you just don't get the chance very often. But I think that both of them were access to health care things. You know, I have, I have hundreds of little stories about giving people pills and, you know, helping that way. But um, those stories were, were kind of bigger clinic stories. Mm -hmm. Anything else you'd like to add about the clinic? I don't know what to say. You know, it's, it's a wonderful, unique place. I mean, probably the reason why I'm still here is that it's hard to top it. <laughs> you know, the, the good things that it offers are, are so amazing and good. And, you know, my coworkers and the patients, and it's hard to leave. <laughs> Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks. And you're welcome. Turn me on. Okay. Just work. How's that? Okay. Sorry, I'm, I just woke up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I work uh, night shift now. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so if you state, start with stating your name about the years that you were here and what you did during that time. Okay. Um, I'm Lois Nakamura, and I worked here from 88 to 95. Um, I was the volunteer on Monday. I'm, an, I'm a nurse. And uh, I would work with the Virginia Mason um, doctor who worked on Mondays. So, so that's about seven years mm -hmm. as a volunteer. Yeah. That's quite a long time. So yeah. Why, why so long? Why here? Um, I fa actually found out about it. Um, I wanted to volunteer somewhere. And I wanted to be in, somewhere in the community, serving the you know community. And uh, I followed Joanne Keenan, who used to, you probably interviewed her, who used to work here on Mondays as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I just left the clinic, and so now there's a position open if you want to go. And I came here, and um, I worked with Joanne up at Harborview, mm -hmm. and uh, was basically serving the um, same population that I was taking care of up in, at Harborview. And it was really nice to get a, um, it was really nice to get a different, um, view of my patients to be able to see them as in the outpatient setting where they were more functional and they were doing better and we we're trying what we could to keep them out of the hospital and you know to maintain their health and things and it was just a nice balance to my work that I was um, at, 
at Harborview and then the works here. It kind of balanced things out. And, uh, and I just like um, the people here. I made a lot of friends and uh, met a lot of really good uh, people and just, I think that's basically what kept me, you know, coming back the whole time. And I enjoyed the patients and the patient population. And um, so I thought, you know, I stayed here as long as I could and then it was very hard for me to leave because it was hard to leave the people and the patients and things. When you think about the clinic now that you've been away for mm -hmm. a couple of years, are there particular images or stories, memories that stand out in your mind? I remember getting oriented on my first day by Carol Glenn. Um, and she was, she's always been a real inspiration to me because I just, I look at her and I think, my God, that's the kind of nurse I want to be. And I was pretty new into nursing when I started here. I think I'd been a nurse for a year. And I just saw this person with so much experience who cared so much for people. And um, she took me, <laughs> on my orientation day, she took me on a tour of the market, walked around, went up to people's uh, apartments, you know, in some of the low income housing here and stuff like that. And I'm like, wow, this is really, I mean, it really opened my eyes up to things. And I just, that's one of the things I remember. And I just remember, um, you know, just the people here, they're just warm and there was, it was just always nice to come in to, to work, which is nice. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Mm -mm. No, I just, uh, I miss it. Yeah. I've been, uh, you know, gone for now, what is it, three years? It doesn't seem like three years, but in a way it does. It yeah. seems longer, but that's it. But I still see a lot of the people okay. in different places, and so since other people have moved, so that's about it. Great, well, thank thanks. You trying to remember. Yeah. He no, actually I got in the film and he didn't. Did you get to ask me questions? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, good. I'm going to ask you some simple questions. You can just start off with stating your name, the years you were here, and what you did. Okay. My name is Linda Secord. Although when I started here at the clinic, I was Linda Griffith. And I started as a member of one of the board committees in 1984 or 1985. I can't remember exactly what. And then I think within a year I was on the board of directors. And I did that until 1990, the summer of 1993, when I became the acting director of the clinic when Gloria went on maternity leave. And then we stayed in a job share until February of 96. And how did that work out, that job share? How did the job share work out? Mm -hmm. What well, like the division of? Oh, it was, um, the job share was good in many ways. Uh, we sort of split it up that I did the internal operations and Gloria did most of the external um, funding and community, community relations, community liaisons, the, um, grants, mm -hmm. and I did the day-to-day -day operations. Right. So. so now that you've been away for just a few years, what, um, when you think about, about the clinic, what, what kind of images come to the forefront? Well, I don't feel like I've ever gone away from the clinic. I stayed involved. I come to all the fundraisers, okay. so I stayed involved that way. And um, the clinic just has a wonderful place in my heart because of the work that we do. And um, so I've worked in, with low-income people for a long time. And I mean, what's really wonderful about coming here today is seeing um, just the kind of people that the clinic attracts to work here. It's just great. I mean, all these people are just great. Um, and they're here because they want to be here. So most everybody here um, could have made more money if they'd worked in a traditional healthcare organization and chose to work here at least for a period of time in their career. And so the clinic is really like the patients. I mean, it's the staff and the patients are more than just people who walk through your door. I mean, they're really committed and wanting to be here. So why do you think it worked out that way? Any any theories on how the clinic was this question so, before. so lucky to, to attract such good people? Well, I think because of what we do and what our mission is, and I think it's because of the way from the start with Chris Hurley setting the tone of the way um, we work with people, whether they're patients or staff. 
which is working with the whole person and treating people with dignity and respect. And so it's a great place to be. And people can come here either as patients or employees and be themselves. And uh, so there's a lot of color here, as you've seen if you've been around. You know, a lot of variety. And, okay. Is there anything you'd like to add or share? Mm -hmm. Just that it's been fun. It's been great. And uh, I think this clinic is going to survive. I mean, one of the advantages the Pike Clinic has from some of the other community clinics is that we have the support of the market community. So we get a lot of um, we get a mile, lot of mileage out of that, and it's a community that people really want to support. And some of the other clinics, who are in other parts of the city, don't get that kind of um, exposure or recognition. And so this this clinic, I think, even though the funding issues are very um, precarious a lot of the times, I think always will be supported by the community and the market community, which is pretty wonderful to be part of. Yes, and unique. Okay. Thank you. Who's gotten better, too? Eh? <laughs> Where, in the market? Or? The old woman is committing suicide? Uh, right there at that second button in the behind. Right here? Uh, no, The old woman is committing suicide and asked the uh, crisis guy where she she wanted to shoot herself in the heart, where she should do it. And he says, under your left breast. She takes the pistol and shoots herself and blows out her kneecap. <laughs> old woman. See, he doesn't have sensitivity, so he doesn't understand these problems. OK. This is quick and easy. Can you state for us your name, the years about that you were here, and what your job was? My name is Carol Glenn, the infamous Carol Glenn. I was here from 1982 to 1989 as a clinic nurse. I worked with Jim Neal uh, for the first year and a half, then I worked with Tom Heller. Did time with Tom Heller. <laughs> what so, else do you want to know? Um, your name has been mentioned. In this, in this very room, in this very interview, a few times. <laughs> really? Yes. Nicely? Um, yes, very much okay, so. Actually. Very nice. That's very nice. So I imagine that there must be some things, that, some impressions that you have of this place, and thinking back on it for a little while. Um, there was a woman here I worked with named Jacqueline Meyer, who was also a nurse. And after she left and after I left, we would meet, and you talk about Working at Pike Market Clinic is the kind of place where you wished you'd never worked at because it set a tone for the rest of your life. And you spend the rest of your life looking for a place like the Pike Market Clinic to work at. Um, there was Joe Martin. I mean, I was here when it was a very small clinic before they made that side over there. The population was different. There was a lot more disenfranchised people, a lot more elders, a lot of people on the edge you know, making contracts with clients, like we cannot continue to see you if you bang your head on the concrete wall. You know, it was an amazing place. Most of know. Um, one, of the, one of the women who, who was in here mentioned that, that she admires you greatly, and she said that because oh. she, um, she said that Carol's such a talented person, and yet, chose to use all of her talent to serve others and was always so caring to the patients. I imagine that on days, most days, it was a challenging task. You know. How did you, how did you deal with it? No, it's not. You know, you just, I, I, I'm not a Christian, but I was raised in a very fundamentalist Christian household, and it's kind of like there but for fortune. Or, you know, the difference between your life and how anybody else's life is is you took the right hand, they took the left hand. You didn't make that stop, and they did, and they went through it and got hit by a car. You know, that's how all of life is. Life is just, you know, you can't be better than anybody else. You can't, um, you know, and a lot of these people were just, they're, they teach you survival. They teach you kindness. They, you know, I'm kind of um, nostalgic. I'm kind of what, idealistic. I've been nursed for 30 years. And I still believe that other people have something to share with me. And my talent only comes because I work with other talented people. Do you have a question for me, sir? Mr. MC? Uh, yeah, Mr. What's the, um, what, what did you see the relationship of the clinic to the market community and to the PDA or the management? 
It, I think it's different now. We had an incredible relationship when the clinic was smaller, and I think the market was less gentrified. Um, you know, De Laurentiis used to give us their burnt pizzas, and the and the candy place used to give us the um, um, candy that didn't turn out right. And you could go to like any bar and get free drinks, and the fishmongers would give you you know discounts on their fish. And it was a community. It was like a little city, and they would come up and. Um, you know, they get cut and you take care of them and you don't tell everybody else they work with what a blithering idiot they were here while they were hurt. Um, it was just, it's like a large family. It was like, it's not like that anymore. It was like this very large, very dysfunctional large family. Um, there's some really marvelous people who were here. The PDA, um, you know, they helped us stay here. You know, they helped us, you know, get the other side. Yeah. Foundation is a one, the foundation that keeps the center alive, the child care center, the Pike Market Senior Center, you know, has done good things for here. I don't know that the community, if it wasn't for the senior center and the market, would have the same flavor. I think all these people who couldn't get health care would have vanished. Anything else you'd like to add? No. Well, <laughs> You're welcome. Great. Hope that was okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really weird when you come back and people... Yeah, it is. So... Karen, put the mic there at the K and the pike. Yeah. Oh. The sweatshirt and put the mic down. Okay, there. I did that. Is it I mean, like right here? Marlis, right. That's right. That way we can get Marlis talking, speaking, hearing. Also. Okay, b before you turn it on, so would you think for a few minutes about some patients? Oh, God. Like, give me a name and I can tell you about somebody. Were you Joe Gannon's doctor? No, I wasn't. Okay. Um, you're Zena's doctor, aren't I you? I am Zena's doctor. She's a perfect person. You know, she's she's everything that the market is, I think. And so if you could talk a little bit about people like her. Um, you were Victor's doctor, which makes me start crying. Victor who? <laughs> Cardea. Oh, God, yeah. And, um... I'd love to talk about Victor. I could talk about Victor. I, I think that'd be really nice, because... Well, anyway. Okay. Well, just prompt me. Okay. Go ahead. So, can you just start off by stating your name and uh, title and when you started working? Uh, well, my name is Les Piddle, and I'm the medical director, and I started here in 1981. Wow. <laughs> That's 17 years ago next month. Um, what else do you want to know? So, Les, <laughs> there must be reasons you've been here for 17 years. What is it? Well, I've always wanted to practice in a place that I felt my skills were needed, mm -hmm. that I want, that I'd be able to see people that um, actually had a lot of um, problems that I could help with. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not interested in being a, a primary care uh, doctor to colds and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. intercurrent uh, illnesses that by and large get better on their own. I, I like taking care of people who have chronic problems that uh, uh, need someone who's going to be there uh, over the long term with them. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that's what this job certainly has, is people with chronic illness yeah. and um, complex medical issues that are challenging uh, for me as a, as a physician. And, and I feel like uh, uh, it's been a real privilege to, to work with these people. It's, uh, every time I see uh, a person and I've known them for years, it, it seems to me that they're giving me uh, a great honor to be able to take care of them. And so it, it's, it's very rewarding in that way. And that's what, that's what kept, kept me here. So you've had some patience for the whole 15 years. Well, that's Is hard. That true? To, uh, 
less and less, I have to say. I mean, there are people that I've taken care of um, for that long. Most of those that have been, I can think of one that has been here for sure all that, that period of time, and mm -hmm. I know you know her. Um, very interesting woman with many, many problems. Um, at one time she was so um, convinced that uh, she had a snake in her stomach mm -hmm. that was keeping her from eating, mm -hmm. that she would only eat uh, liquid foods. And uh, it took a long uh, bit of uh, talking and relating before she was willing to let us find out that it was really a uh, gastric ulcer that had gotten to the point of uh, complete uh, outlet obstruction and uh, allowed uh, surgery and uh, allowed her that, to then eat um, solid foods for the first time in 10 years. Um, so that, and she's still uh, a patient here and um, you know, very and much. And I know the kinds of things that she would say about you are that you are open-minded and you allow people the ability to think about alternative things and, and well I, you can't take people's belief systems away right. I think I, mean, I, I have my belief system they sometimes coincide with patients but not necessarily and we have to work together to, you know to come to a conclusion that's uh, that's helpful mm -hmm. with them I, I, I'll tell you, the, the patient I probably feel the most for after all these years was, uh, was Victor. Mm -hmm. uh, Victor was a, a beautiful man who I think was loved by everybody that he was in contact mm -hmm. with. Um, and came in and had pneumonia at a young age and it was the first sign that he had AIDS. Uh, and uh, Victor and I worked together for, I would say, about five, six years with his illness and became friendly. I found out that he was uh, an architecture mm -hmm. uh, student mm -hmm. and uh, had graduated but had never gotten his license. And we started working together on my house uh, and went through several iterations of design mm -hmm. um, uh, together and it was the first house that he designed and as it turned out it was the only house that he designed before he died huh. but he got to be in it at our opening house oh. and barely made the tour um, just about I would say a month or two before he died, and I, he taught me a lot. I, he taught me a lot about life and uh, living through such uh, difficult torment that, as he as he mm -hmm. had to suffer with his illness. I have many of his photographs on my walls. Do you? I do. Yeah. He's a very very good photographer. Yeah. Well, that's how he made his living. Right. Actually, was an architectural photography. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and that's one of my, that's yeah, at the entry to my house. Yeah, uh, one of his one photographs. One of his photographs. Hmm. I have one of um, the turf before it was torn down on 3rd, and, uh -huh. and he took it at about 5.30 in the morning, and the lighting is perfect, and it's just, it's the coolest photograph. Hmm. Was there a so, period of time when uh, you felt AIDS might uh, be the... Uh, death of the clinic or might overpower the clinic or, or they were taking into what was the what was the impact of AIDS from the early 80s on, on the well, clinic? Well, I, th I think it really helped us gain some focus. We had started out as a clinic for uh, elderly, poor elderly, and were set up to take care of uh, chronically ill. And when AIDS came along, it was really what we were set up to do, taking care of chronically ill people. It, the difficulty was 
that it was a younger age group and it required a lot more education on the doctors parts and and more support for the clinic more support staff especially among the uh, social workers to deal with the uh, many problems that they brought um, with their illness um, you know the social problems the housing problems and, and it led to us uh, uh, efforts by our former director into the AIDS housing um, efforts that uh, have you know, just blossomed throughout the country from, from her leadership. Um, but it, it helped us realize that we really were a, a, a clinic that was geared toward the chronically ill and the seriously ill, that we were going to take care of people from primary care through hospital and nursing home. And it wasn't uh, going to be just a primary care clinic that then referred people on and uh, had other specialists take care of them. We wanted to take on the challenge of, of uh, tackling that disease. And with it came another set of problems. The first group of uh, patients that had AIDS were by and large uh, gay men. And the second wave of uh, patients uh, were by and large uh, men with substance abuse problems. And that we, we tackled also and has uh, really changed a lot of the practice a, at the clinic because we see more and more uh, drug addicted people with and without AIDS. And, and that has changed us more than anything else, I think. Hmm. Well, how about all the period where um, there was going to be um, you know, health care reform and the state was revising a lot of things. It seemed like that had a really big impact on how the clinic was looking at its work. Well, it made us change administratively how we, how we were looking at taking care of people, uh, trying to set up uh, structures so that we would be able to survive in a managed care mm -hmm. environment, um, case management and managed care uh, utilization costs and, and uh, those types of uh, expensive efforts. As it turned out, as, as you know, the state didn't go manage care for our population. And I, I think for very good reason in that the, this population is so sick, um, as the cartoon says, I'm sorry you're too sick for managed care. Mm -hmm. So the state realized that and we had to really sort of undo all the efforts and the costs that we had already incurred in uh, getting ready for managed care. And that, that was hard financially on the clinic. What about any other memories of patients or staff people? Anything else come? Well, there's great, I have great memories of certain staff people. I mean, I, I, it was really great for me tonight to see Stan Henry, yeah. the uh, impresario yeah. of the front desk, uh, who single-handedly did what I think any three people would would take. Um, I, you know, I, I remember certainly the. Uh, uh, sure-handedness um, and say assertiveness of uh, Chris Hurley. You knew who I was going to say too. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and the just the uh, uh, Scott Glasscock and his ability to come in and uh, be the diplomat mm -hmm. in a time of change and transition. Um, you know, I, I think this place has been really blessed by wonderful people to work with. Mm -hmm. Certainly Tom Heller has uh, been a great support for, for me as a fellow physician for mm -hmm. most of all these years uh, and someone that I have learned to turn to uh, many times for his advice medically as, as well as personally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, those are just standouts. Anything else come to mind, Paul? Um, I, 
I recall back in the late 80s, there was an early, right, maybe the cusp of the 90s, they let some doctors go. You had to cut your budget back quite quickly, and it was a, it was a disappointment to uh, professionals. You have a good memory. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that was a hard time. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was it was very hard because it, it happened so abruptly. Um, I don't I don't think there is still uh, a lot of good feelings about that period uh, left. Really, I mean I think things were, did not happen in, in a way that was normally done in most in most businesses. You know, no layoff time. No. Um, Chance for the the doctor who was laid off to to you know, get other work and uh, feel good about the, the time that, that he was here. So I, I, that was a particularly difficult situation. But you now, as you were implying, you know the the budget was tight, and we were f pretty far behind the market in compensation. So it was. It was a negotiation at the time between uh, the board and the staff about how we could manage, and that was the, the board's um, decision, was in order to bring the rest of the staff up more toward market to let some of the other staff go, and that, that, that's a very difficult decision to make. That's all I can Ever. think of. Yeah. Can you think of anything else? I'm, Terrible on camera. You, you, well, so. you totally covered the gamut on um, on different you know kinds of activities at the clinic you've been involved with, in planning and certainly the whole medical realm of the clinic. So I'll tell you the one thing that uh, I think has been interesting to me and has kept my interest uh, here has been what the clinic has uh, tried to do in involving itself with the other community clinics in, in town. The whole effort of trying to set up a, uh, a network of uh, community health care um, systems and a referral network to specialists and uh, getting the, uh, the other doctors in the community clinics to involve themselves in hospital care has been uh, I think one of the things that uh, this clinic has uh, led in, mm -hmm. um, for a while we were the only doctors in clinics uh, actually attending uh, on patients really? in, in the hospitals when I first uh, wow. came here. Huh. And I remember um, Michael Robinson from uh, the Indian Health Board wanted to start doing that, but there's a lot of problems in doing that because it, it impacts your productivity uh -huh. on a primary care um, side. And uh, there wasn't a lot of support, uh, especially from the, uh, the uh, feder uh, mm -hmm. federal mm -hmm. productivity standards to allow for that type of loss of, uh, mm -hmm. of numbers. Mm -hmm. um, they eventually, the feds finally came around and included uh, hospital visits as part of your productivity standard. Uh, but that took years, really, mm -hmm. uh, and people had to uh, incur that loss uh, despite that. Mm -hmm. um, but with the gain of the continuity of care that you get when you start taking care of your people mm -hmm. in the hospital mm -hmm. as well as out. Mm -hmm. Now, for us, that made eminent sense because of the chronic illness of our patients mm -hmm. and the uh, loss of uh, ability to take care of them if uh, they went to the hospital under someone else's care. So we felt very strongly that that was uh, an important part of the kind of care that we were going to deliver. Um, and the other clinics uh, more and more uh, came uh, to that same model and are all doing that now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a universal standard. Um, that plus uh, just trying to work with the other clinics and um, in, in working together on uh, quality mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. uh, uh, resource sharing, um, I think w will in the end make this whole uh, safety net of health care for poor people a mm -hmm. lot stronger. And you're referring to things like the clinic sharing finance directors and right. planning people. Yeah, that's great.
And I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be doing uh, things like hiring um, together for uh, locum tenants uh, mm -hmm. positions, mm. um, maybe sharing uh, MIS systems, mm -hmm. um, other ways of uh, making it more uh, efficient. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Les. Thank you very much. No, uh, no. Okay, no. good. <coughs> So I just sort of sit here? Yeah. That's a good place to sit. While it's just fiddling with this, I'm sure you can turn it off. Okay. okay. What you do with you is just uh, kind of hold that or put it in your lap and pin this one. Right I'll take a look at this. Okay. Right here. Okay. There we go. To this spot. Uh huh. Yeah. Fine. Very good. <clears throat> so, um, what we do is we say it's August 18th and we ask your name. Okay. And your name is? Stan Henry. What, is the, what were your year, years with the uh, with the clinic? I came in May of 1983 and I left in September of 1988. Five year run there. Uh huh. Kind of five and a half actually. And what job did you do? I did uh, two different jobs. I was receptionist initially, and then I became administrative assistant and sort of supervised the front desk. Les Piddle said that you did three jobs right while holding down one at the front desk. <laughs> well, job of three people. Uh, that's, you know, that's really very sweet of people. I, um, the front desk was a busy place, and I really was the only receptionist for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the phone was constantly ringing, and people were constantly coming up to the front, and it became a dance-like kind of thing for me. And I really scrambled, and I really, I did work hard, and I had a really good time. I got to the point I recognized people's voices, and I knew everybody's situation, and so I could uh, kind of be warmed up to whatever they might be coming in for medically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know, I think the clinic maybe got a little busier at the point that other people came on, and... Uh, but I probably did enjoy it more than most people enjoyed reception. I actually saw the whole reception thing here as a kind of, uh, <laughs> oh, it's very embarrassing, as a kind of um, <clears throat> mystical meditation. Oh, and I saw <clears throat> that too. Yeah, theater, theater, dance, joke, the whole thing. But I saw it kind of as every person um, as sort of the face of God but not of anybody's version of God, just that the universe was in everybody's face and in everybody's voice and in everybody's story. And I just kind of rolled with the stories and the voices and the faces and I would see people and I would look at them and I would try to just know who they were and actually let them come forward. And, and so it was, it was a very wonderful experience for me and I really, really loved the, the patients and the staff and I enjoyed the theatrical part of it, and I enjoyed being part of that theatricality and even generating part of it. And I enjoyed the dance-like quality of it and the high speed. It was really frenetic, and it was a lot of fun. I eventually burned out. It was too much after a while. What uh, did you do before the clinic and after the clinic? In other words, what did you do in real life? In real life? Yeah. <laughs> I actually think the clinic was probably as close to real life as I've ever come in employment. But uh, before coming to the clinic, I, uh, I was an idiot stick jockey at Virginia Mason. I, I, I've worked in university administration, and I worked in radio, and um, did some teaching and things. But when I came to Seattle, I had kind of lousy jobs. And so right before coming here, um, I was a, a recovery room technician and a surgery technician and then an admitting clerk and uh, PBX operator and those, you know, uh, medical records person at Virginia Mason. But for a while I held open guts. <laughs> and then after, <clears throat> after I left the clinic, I went to become the assistant to the dean at the School of Social Work at the U. Mm -hmm. Are you doing that now? No, no. I, uh, I was there for a couple years and more and then um, took a year off just to write fiction. And then I went back to work at the AIDS clinic at uh, Harborview. And I was there for two and a half years, but it was the end of 10 years of working in AIDS, and I completely crashed. Mm 
in 1993, <coughs> excuse me, and couldn't work at all after that. I simply could not deal. Well, the AIDS uh, um, began when you were just yes. started here. Yes. And grew in great size. Yes. Sure and I, go ahead. Yeah. Recognizing both the patient load and the nature of the patient. Right. Right, it's true. And in fact, because, see, I started volunteering. Um, I was one of the original AIDS volunteers in Seattle, and I started in the spring, early spring of 1983, and then I came to the clinic in May. So I had already started working in AIDS, and I was on the, the group that put together the Northwest AIDS Foundation, mm -hmm. and um, I was one of the founders of Seattle AIDS Support Group, and. I was on the mayor's first AIDS, uh, the ad hoc council task force that he put together. And um, because of my work doing that, people who needed medical care started coming to the clinic because they felt this was a safe place. And so slowly, um, and people here were very embracing. Joe Martin was wonderful. Joe Martin, I was actually the first AIDS social worker in Seattle, totally as a volunteer, and Joe Martin taught me how to do it. And um, it just sort of grew. It was an organic kind of thing, and because of the receptivity of people here, you know, and so it was. It was a good thing. Uh, all your time <coughs> here was in this facility off of Post Alley. Uh, yeah. Although the the annex was built at the time that I was here. And the Congregate Care Center down in Western. That was also built while I was here. Right. Right. But I was out here on the front desk, and then I was over in an office on the other side for a little while. Is it okay that I look at you, oh, as opposed fine, yeah, to yeah. as opposed to the camera, or? <laughs> oh, it's better that way. It doesn't. Uh, uh, it looks. So, this. What what about the problems of this physical, the constraints here in the, of this clinic? Well, the clinic has always been pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think its problems are in many ways its strengths because it's totally organic. It's totally part of the neighborhood. It's totally integrated into this region. It's very comfortable for people. Um, no one who lives around here, especially vulnerable or uh, poor people, you know, older people, whatnot, street people, nobody feels distanced or alienated by this environment. Um, but there's never been enough room to do what you needed to do to put people, to have people have offices, to even have files stored. Um, there have been some times that the clinic's been pretty dirty just because there was so much junk yeah. around and there was no place to put it and uh, papers would pile up and all those sort of things and things were in boxes and so it's been, it's been a, I think, a real challenge all along. Yeah. Um, working on the front desk, you had to work with other um, funders and <clears throat> other hospitals, uh, for referrals, all kinds of outreach. Uh -huh. really, you're relationship with other uh, clinics was, uh, and other parts of the medical uh, sure. establishment was greater. What, were, what was the feedback you got about this clinic from, from elsewhere in the city? Sure. Well, while I was here, this clinic was very well respected. This mm -hmm. clinic was seen as a very humane place. It was seen um, as a medically very proficient, competent place. It was seen as a very warm and friendly place and even carried a certain um, prestige and cachet because it was in the market. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was very well integrated. I mean, always when you're do dealing with low income medical care, you're kind of at the periphery of the medical industry and you are always scrambling, scrambling for resources and there's just never enough. But so in some ways the clinic I think was always marginal, but my perception was that it was respected and that um, various larger institutions that became referral um, centers for mm -hmm. medical care from here yeah. um, were actually often quite embracing, um, at least in intent. Uh, I think some of the deals that uh, managed care came in while I was at this clinic and, and some of the complexities of the changing medical um, situation in the United States and the cruel um, shift in the society toward essentially ostracizing people who did not have resources and whatnot, I think really changed all the relationships of all medical centers uh, with each other. And um, 
uh, some of the larger institutions really were not always able to stay in the same business that they had been initially or that their original vision had been called to. I and witness what's happening with Pacific Medical Center now um, and what has happened over the many years. So um, this clinic, I think, in some ways had a rocky, exactly, exactly, or Providence Medical Center, exactly. Changes in the medical industry in the last 10 years, just in the Seattle area. Right. And of course, it's repeated in every city sure. metropolitan area in the country. Sure. Have been greater than they were in the first the 100 years preceding. Yes. Uh, I, don't, I don't think um, institutions can take <clears throat> shift on that. I don't either. Like no, I don't they either. With, uh, they can't be better. Uh, right. <laughs> so, uh, so you're out of medical work. I am. I am. Well, it's actually been very helpful for me. But the same values that I had while I was here, I've never been a medico. I mean, even when I was here, I was more of a social worker and more, I mean, I'm a writer and I'm essentially a self-styled artist. Um, and that approach is what I brought to the front desk. I mean, like I said, I looked at it as an art form and that was why I could enjoy it. But I also looked at people as the stuff of that art form. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, many people around here might perceive me as a sellout because I work in corporate America at the moment. Mm -hmm. But I supervise, uh, I mean, you know, it's not a prestigious thing. Yeah. Um, I work in technical support, which is like the dog shit dregs of, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's customer service and all that sort of thing. And, um, but, I work at Adobe Systems where there are wonderful products, wonderful products, and uh, totally um, love the technology and the people I work with are really smart and they're, they're young and they're very creative and they have so much potential. And so because I get to directly supervise 10 people, I actually get to do with these kids in corporate America what I was doing at the front desk here. So I help, I see them. And, and I listen to what they have to say, and I help create an environment that allows them to grow, allows them to do really exciting things, allows them to get education and training, and to literally grow out of what we do there. Yeah. So it's exactly the same value system. It's exactly the same sort of artistic kind of thrust with people being the stuff of the art form. And so, yeah, so maybe I'm a sellout, but it's, it's actually been very kind. And I will tell you that software, Adobe Systems saved my life at one point when I crashed after working at the AIDS clinic at Harborview. Uh -huh. um, and I was so grateful to be able to work with computers yeah. and to be able to go someplace where nobody died. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. I think that's um, 10-4, as I said. Okay. <laughs>